So Don, do you want to go ahead and lead the way? Sure, I, I will uh, kick us off and good morning to everyone. It's uh, nice to see you uh, on this Thursday morning, bright and early. And um, I am Don Allen, the uh, Chief Financial Officer of Stanley Black & Decker, and I'm also the Chair of the United Way of Central and Northeastern Connecticut. Um, I'm in my second year now as the Chair, and been on the board for many years before that. Um, we'd like to just start the call with maybe just some quick intros of everybody mm -hmm. on. Um, and so, you know, maybe Mary Ellen, you can start and we'll just go from there. Sure. Hi, I'm Mary Ellen Jones. Um, I head up sales for the Asia Pacific region at Pratt & Whitney. Mm -hmm. Nice to meet you. Thank you. You too. Paul, you want to quickly sure. introduce yourself? Uh, I'm Paul Beach. I uh, retired uh, from United Technologies back when there was a United Technologies <laughs> uh, four <laughs> years ago. And uh, right now, my key distinction is I've got my golf handicap down to 9.2. So... <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, Sounds great. like you're doing retirement the right way. I'm doing my very best. <laughs> <laughs> nice, to, nice to see you. Thank you. Nice to see you. Thank you, Don. And we have another Kate Blackburn. I'm not sure. Greg, I think that's you. The Greg, is that you? And you're on mute. Well, I'm, I'm not Greg and I'm not Kate Blackburn. <laughs> but I assume you're talking to me. My name is Josh Martin. I'm with Deloitte. Oh, okay. Hey Josh, good morning. Hey Josh. Thanks for joining us. And maybe the folks from United Way can quickly introduce themselves as well. Paula, you wanna start? Sure, Paula Gilberto. I'm the president and CEO. I'm, hi, I'm Kim Rees. I am the director of leadership and major giving here at uh, United Way. And I am your key contact uh, for all things United Way, uh, especially focused on the Tocqueville Society. Mm -hmm. Good morning. I am Stephanie Bowles. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for United Way. Hi there. I am Kate Blackburn. I'm the Marketing Communications Manager at United Way. Good morning. I'm Maura Cook. Um, I lead our marketing and engagement work at United Way. Good morning. I'm Jesse Mejia and I oversee workplace giving. And hi, everyone. I'm Catherine Conley. I'm the Director of Research Engagement for the United for Alice team. I'm based in New Jersey. Great. Thank, thank you, everyone. And um, so we, we, this is our first town hall. We're going to start a quarterly town hall process with the Tocqueville Society members um, in our United Way um, organization. And it's really going to focus on the issues that are affecting the well-being of our families, the individuals, and the children in our community and how the United Way partnership and community and business can work together to, to have an effective impact on, on really helping individuals that are in, in these periods of need. And clearly we have a significant period of need as we've gone through this very difficult COVID-19 pandemic and how it's impacted not only our community, but the global communities, obviously in a very significant way. So today we wanna to spend more time, a little more focused on the economic conditions in the state of Connecticut um, as well as get into a little detail on the Alice report that was recently um, uh, published and um, kind of focus on some of the key topics there that Catherine and Paul are going to walk us through. Um, clearly, this society is, is a significant part of United Way. Um, we have a, you know, about 81 members in our, in our region um, that helped us last year raise over a million dollars, which we, we greatly appreciate. Uh, those of you who are on the call today uh, contributing that money. It's a very significant part of, of the impact that we have in the community. And I just want to pause and say thank you for that. It's, it's greatly appreciated. So with that, I am, I'm going to pass it to Paul and Catherine and, and kind of dive right into the detail because we are a little bit behind. So, Paul? Thank you so much, Don, and thank you all for attending are participating this morning. Um, just want to let you know we are expecting some additional Tocqueville guests, uh, Tocqueville donors, and so there may be additional people that jump on the on the Zoom meeting here. Um, but as Don mentioned, you know this is uh, Connecticut United Way's Alice Report, our fourth report 
Uh, we release it over Labor Day to call attention to the fact that these are hardworking individuals, hardworking men and women. We want to share the highlights of the report. We want to put that in context in terms of what your local United Way has done in the past that we feel has helped uh, families um, as we have progressed through these times, but also call attention to the fact that with the pandemic, we know that there have been significant health and financial security challenges that have happened to families. Um, so we'll be talking about that as well. Um, for me, one of the most important things about the ALICE report is, is what it stands for, Asset Limited, Income Constrained, Employed. These are individuals that are working. They're working hard in many instances. They're working multiple jobs. And another key piece about ALICE is that ALICE represents people that we know. Uh, they could be our family members, our friends, uh, the people that we see um, that are caring for elderly in in convalescent homes or skilled nursing facilities, people like my dad, who was a janitor in a school system, people like my mom, who worked in retail uh, to earn a living. So many of us came from Alice households, well, many of us know people who are Alice, um, and many individuals are a paycheck or two away from slipping into a financial insecure situation. Um, we do want to give thanks, by the way, to not only our colleagues, the United for Alice team, and I'll turn it over to Catherine Connolly in a moment, but I also want to hold up the fact that this year's report was sponsored by the Hartford and by Xerox, and we very much appreciate, appreciate their efforts. Um, this report is being done, the Alice report is being done in um, 20 states. And also it's informed by key business leaders as well. And again, I just want to acknowledge that we have a colleague from the Hartford. Uh, the Hartford joined the National Alice Advisory Council and has weighed in in terms of the business case for helping Alice households throughout the country. So with us, I'm going to turn it over to Catherine. She really is our guru in this and uh, appreciate you being here, Catherine. Thanks, Paula. Kim, I'm sorry, do you mind making me a co-host so I can share my screen? Sorry about that, thank you. It's not allowing me to. Okay, Maura, sorry, do you mind driving the presentation? I apologize. Well, we're learning our way around Zoom, aren't we? We had it all ironed out and I don't know what <laughs> happened this morning. <laughs> Oh, great. Here we go. Okay. So thank you for giving me an opportunity to talk about the highlights report this morning. I just want to share some of the top level data and have an opportunity to answer any questions that you might have. So as uh, Paula just mentioned, ALICE is an acronym that stands for Asset Limited, Income Constrained, Employed. And so ALICE households are households that um, have income above the federal poverty level, but below a basic cost of living threshold, what we call the ALICE threshold. And I'll explain in just a few minutes how we um, calculate that ALICE threshold so that makes a little bit more sense. Next slide. So in 2018, so I, I first should preface, this is a 2020 report, but the data it included in this report runs from 2007 to 2018. So this is a really uh, important pre-pandemic benchmark of households in Connecticut prior to the pandemic. Our next report will look at the impact of the pandemic on Alice households, but there's really already a lot we can learn from this current report and the last Great Recession that can help us you know, plan and think about how Alice households will fare through this current pandemic. So currently in Connecticut, 27% of households qualify as Alice, and an additional 11% of households live below the federal poverty level. So when we combine those, uh, what we call our below the Alice threshold percent is 38% of households are really struggling to make ends meet. So that's more than a third of households in the state. It's over 500,000 households that are struggling or living paycheck to paycheck. And you can see in this map of the cities and towns in Connecticut that it, out of the 148 uh, Connecticut cities and towns, one in five households are Alice households. 
And the shading at the bottom shows you where the higher percentages of households living below the Alice threshold are in the state. So those deeper blue um, towns and cities are the ones that are struggling even more, just to give you some perspective. And so I, I mentioned a minute ago how we come up with a, a budget, a household survival budget. It's a bare minimum budget of what individuals or families, households need to get by or not even really to get by, really just to meet their basic expenses. And many struggle to do even that. But so we use these official and publicly available sources from the Census Bureau to HUD, SDA, to come up with a monthly budget. So I could just go through these quickly. So for housing, we use the uh, HUD fair market rent. Uh, we also use uh, American Community Service uh, data to um, adjust uh, count the housing data in uh, metropolitan service areas. That's a new addition this year. For child care, we use registered family child care homes rather than a center based child care because the family child care homes are the least expensive. And so we used a local Connecticut source for that this year, the Office of Early. For food, we use the USDA 50 level lowest to four levels food plan. And we also um, adjust that with county level data through um, the uh, Feeding America cost of food index. And then Transportation, we use Federal Highway Administration data. We also include operating cost of a car. Um, we also look at areas that rely primarily on public transportation. And in those neighborhoods where there's a higher usage of public transportation, we use public transportation costs. In healthcare, we're using an employer-sponsored health insurance premium, because that was the most common form of health insurance in 2018, plus out-of-pocket expenses. And then taxes are federal and state income taxes. So then we come up with this uh, monthly budget. On top of that, I miss technology because that really homes can't function right now without some type of technology, a cell phone, um, you know, um, especially now during the pandemic, you know, most people are, are either working from home or doing online remote schools. So we added that in uh, recently. And then the miscellaneous is just a 10% of the total to cost to cover cost overruns. Um, and so that monthly budget then, with from that, we come up with um, we, six different categories or households, and I'll show you what those look like in just a minute. Um, and from there, we set the Alice threshold from the, uh, use that budget to determine that the threshold for each county in the, in the state. So our, our lowest or our basic unit is, is county level data. The next slide. This is an example of the household survival budget at the state level. So here we're showing the single, our brand new senior budget. This is a new budget for this year. Um, and we decided to do this because we realized that senior house, seniors households budgets are different than a single adult or a family budget. And we wanted to make sure that we were capturing that. And in addition here, you see a family budget, which is two adults, one infant and one preschooler. There's three other budgets on our website as well. We have um, two adults now, two seniors, and also a family of four with two adults and two children, uh, school age children. So more variation is, is offered on our, on our website. But this just gives you a diff, uh, an example of what, how the costs differ. So for a single adult, the annual wage needed is 28,908. The, the um, wage to meet that would be 1445. For a single, a senior adult, it's 31,752. And that reflects a higher healthcare cost because many seniors have chronic health issues, um, they have higher out-of-pocket expenses typically, even though they're on, many of them are on Medicare. And then the hourly wage for a senior is $15.88. And then the family budget is the highest budget uh, for $90,660, and that would require a uh, monthly wage of $45.33. So you can just get a, an idea right here how, how much the family um, cost is, how much higher for a family to live in, in Connecticut versus a single adult. So here again, just comparing. So a single adult needs 14.45 per hour and a family of four requires 45.33 per hour. So that if you had two earners, they could each earn half of that, um, but you know, it just shows how that, uh, how that works. And then in addition to that, I think the, the, if I'm remembering this correctly, the minimum wage in Connecticut is about 10, 10, 10, I think it was in 2018. So um, you need to earn even above minimum wage to, to meet this budget. And then this is just, we just wanted to pull out the senior household 
survival budget again, um, and I, I think I already covered this, but really it's because they spend less on food than a family. Um, they're also reduced spending on transportation because they're not commuting to work. They have less family responsibilities, you know, moving kids around to school events and so on. And also the increased spending on, on health care. So that senior survival budget falls really right in between the single adult and the family budget at 1588 per hour. And then this is a, a, an interesting chart that shows how much people are earning in Connecticut in terms of wages. So you can see right off the bat that less the, the primarily the, the highest uh, percentage, 45% of workers are, are making an hour. And even within that bar, uh, more than half are, are making between 10 and $15 an hour. So with the highest household survival budget, you can see how many people would fall below the ability to meet that basic bare minimum budget. And then another 39% are in the 20 to 40 range, 9% in the 40 to 60, 5% in 60 to 80, and a very small percent making more than, than $80 an hour. And I think Paula really covered this in her introduction, but these are, you know, the, the, just a, a reminder that Alice are people that we rely on every day. So when you think about, you know, maybe not so much now that we're all working from home, but when you were going out to work in the morning, you know, people who uh, are taking care of our children while we work, there are home health aides that are helping uh, take care of the elderly while we're at work. There are uh, people that are the gas attendant who's filling your car with gas serves you coffee. So they're really the people that are keeping the economy running on a day-to-day -day basis and allowing many of us to stay in the workplace. Um, and also at the same time during the pandemic, it, was, it became really clear how much Alice workers are essential uh, to the, the economy and, and what a contribution they make to all of us in our, our retail salespeople and the food stores. And we just think about uh, what we would have done without Alice during the pandemic. Uh, and many of them putting themselves at risk uh, time period they didn't have an opportunity to take off from work and uh, you know going not only themselves but going back to their families at the end of their shifts. So, um, I think we're all recognizing the, the contributions that Alice makes at this point even more so. Catherine there was a question about the budget and it says oh, sure. do, you, uh, do you consider impacts of existing supports transfer payment programs like SNAP and EITC uh, in your calculation? No, we don't. They're, they are not included in that, actually. Um, we're doing more research now on public assistance. We've, we've been getting lots more questions about that lately, about whether or not Alice households uh, qualify for those. And many, many do not uh, qualify for. Uh, SNAP is one where they are more likely to qualify for, but other public service programs like TANF and things like that, they generally don't. So, um, and we don't, we're not able to separate out Alice and poverty households. So we're but we are doing some work in that area and seeing if we can get more data. But no, they're not um, actually not included in the budget. And so here again, we're talking about how the Alice uh, workers keep the economy running. So there's a, this pyramid is called our maintainer pyramid. And what you can see is the maintainers are, like we said, the ones who support us all on a day to day. So infrastructure jobs would be administrators, um, construction, uh, workers, manufacturers, um, really anyone who supports the infrastructure of our communities. Nurturers are our, our healthcare support personnel, our educators, our food and food service workers, hospitality and tourism. So really industries that were hard hit again by the pandemic, especially hospitality and tourism, um, and some of the you know restaurants and things like that where people were working. So what we're showing in this pyramid is that there's high percentages of uh, jobs in these categories that are paid less than $20 an hour. And those jobs are, are more vulnerable um, to, uh, to layoffs and things like that as well. Um, and as you, as you can see, as you climb the pyramid here, adapters and inventors. So we're moving into jobs like analysts, programmers, R&D, scientists, engineers, those kinds of jobs. Very, very few of those are paid less than $20 an hour. So uh, while, while we tend to focus on the innovators in our media, and we hear a lot about those types of positions, it's these maintainers we're trying to highlight that are really uh, sort of the foundation or base of our, our economy. And so I think I mentioned already how uh, important these jobs are now during the, the pandemic, the nurturer role, our, our healthcare heroes. Uh, and it may take you know, some time for many of these jobs to ramp back up. We know that some small businesses are not gonna make it back. Uh, they won't ramp back up, they're closed, closing down. Uh, but others, 
over time, you know, will we'll come back. But Alice found households in the meantime are taking a big hit. And then um, this is a, a, we wanted to highlight how the um, Alice households are across the board. So if you looked at a, um, we have a figure in the report that shows all the demographic groups that are Alice households. And in Connecticut, because the white, pop, the white population is the, in sheer numbers, the biggest group, there'll be more white households below the Alice threshold. But there are groups within there that are disproportionately impacted. So what we're showing here is that within Black and Hispanic households, there are more than 50% of those um, households are below the Alice threshold. So 57% of Black households and 63% of Hispanic households are living below the Alice threshold. In addition, we have a high percentage in the under 25-year-old age group, and which kind of makes sense if you think about it. They're young people who are just getting going in their careers. Many have very big student loan debt coming out of college. And you know, this is a really hard time to come out of college. I actually have a, a recent college grad, uh, one of my daughters, and I can tell you it's, it, this is not an easy time to be looking for a, for a job. So um, the, the under 25 have a hard time. Seniors are more than, uh, generally around 50% of senior households are Alice. Um, and also our single parent families are high percentages. So you can see here, single female headed with children, 73% of those households are Alice. And again, you have a one, you know, one earner in the household with children, you can see how that would be um, a high percentage in the single female headed with children and how that compares to the state overall at, at 38%. So um, the total household numbers are given along the bar at the bottom to give you some perspective of how big those groups are in the state. But we just, this is all part of, you know, this is a big, like conversation right now in the um, in the in the news and the media about how there, this you know, systemic uh, discrimination, racism is is really feeding this type of uh, income inequality and leaving uh, you know many of these uh, groups very vulnerable right now during the pandemic. So just to summarize a little bit some of the key trends. So we know that racial and ethnic disparities and hardship are growing, particularly among certain groups, as I just mentioned. So they're disproportionately high among these groups, Black and Hispanic households. We also know that um, there's a, uh, there are a higher percentage of, a higher percentage of workers that are now working uh, as gig workers or freelance and contractors. And those jobs are very vulnerable uh, because they don't have a set schedule. Many are hourly paid, they don't have benefits, and they can't you know, accumulate um, retirement savings and things like that. So we also, we also know that some of these jobs that are being um, out, you know, re replaced right now during the pandemic that aren't coming back, a lot of those workers will need new, new skills um, and new training. So we want to focusing on upskilling and online training and work-based opportunities for Alice workers that are not, no longer going to have a place in, in the workforce. And there are a, you know, a number of jobs that are being automated. At, this, at the lower, lower level jobs are more likely to be automated. So we are recognized too that those workers will need additional skills to find a new place in the, in the workplace. And the other you know, big theme in our report this year is that worker vulnerability is really increasing while wages are remaining uh, pretty stagnant. So we're not seeing wages increase as quickly as the cost of living is increasing. Cost of living is increasing faster. So more than 50% of workers in Connecticut are paid hourly. And as I just mentioned, hourly workers are really at greater risk uh, and they often don't receive benefits or uh, you know, opportunities to save for their future and build assets, which is a really important um, piece. So Alice households, not only, you know, if you're living, pay, think about if you're living paycheck to paycheck and you can't put any money uh, in the bank or save for the future, uh, it really, you, and many times they have to rely on putting things on credit cards or building debt rather than savings. So they end up in a, in a position of um, you know, having to dig out of debt rather than saving and being prepared for their, for their future. Um, and they, or they don't have extra money to do to, for education and things like that that would help their household move to a better, more financially viable position. So um, those are really just some of the key trends and uh, there's lots and I encourage you to go to our, our website to check it out because you can really dig down into the local data. Uh, there's a county profile page where you can, at the bottom of the page, you can find additional geographies and you can look at sub-county level data and towns and cities. Um, I think some of that will be of, of 
just to uh, beyond the state level data. And also we just added a brand new um, COVID tracker on our website, which is tracking uh, COVID and households below the Alice threshold. So pretty interesting to see, and I uh, would encourage you, and that's updated daily. So that's another really great resource we have on our website. So um, any questions for me before I turn it over back to Paula? Any additional questions? I guess I would just comment that we've done um, these Alice exercises at some offsites at Pratt, and sorry, my dog's in the background there. Okay. So, uh, which has been very helpful in, in understanding exactly how tight these budgets are and how limited the resources are. In fact, I think Maura, you're, Maura is familiar to me. I think Maura might have helped us with, with some of those exercises. But um, yeah, that it yeah. Really did hit home and made an impact on folks. Oh, that's great to hear. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. So um, for Paul and um, Josh, who was on the call, um, and Don, we call that the making choices um, exercise, and we've adapted it so that it can be done uh, in this virtual environment that we're currently in um, versus an in-person exercise. And with that, um, there are, these are actual Alice household scenarios. Names have been changed, and uh, people are, told you are the Smith family and here's your overall income and you pull card, you know, similar to a Monopoly game. So you're pulling a card and find out that your car has broken down and you have to make some choices. And, and the whole point is to see if you can get through a month um, on what an Alice household income is given the everyday challenges that every one of us faces. That's great. Uh, anyone else? Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Catherine. And Catherine's going to stay on the call in case there are some questions that, that come up throughout. Um, so while Catherine, thank you, did a great job just presenting um, the overall kind of scenario for the state, um, our United Way represents 52 communities. And those are cities and towns. Our service area, as you know, goes west to New Britain, up to the Massachusetts border, all the way to the eastern, far eastern portion of the state, uh, the quiet corner, and then down to um, uh, Marlboro, Wethersfield, Newington, et cetera. So you can see like in that, we have quite a range, right? We have affluent communities in the Farmington Valley, and we have very challenged communities, particularly in our urban areas and more rural parts of our region. Um, so, um, but the good news, I guess, is that because of some of those more affluent communities, um, our trends in terms of the number of households that live below the Alice threshold is just slightly below the state average. So while the state is averaging 38% of households, um, we are 35%. And it is somewhat uh, of a very slight improvement over the prior report two years ago. But again, I just want to remind us that the data that was used was data from 2018. And so uh, clearly a lot has happened just since um, the winter and the spring with respect to the coronavirus and, and what's happened. So we're in the process of um, assessing that with United Way 211, also our colleagues at United for Alice in terms of the effects that COVID-19 has, has brought on families. And we know it's been significant. We're trying to ground that. Um, also want to point out that the household survival budget itself continues to increase. And so for our region, just our 52 communities, um, it's up um, uh, from the prior report. So the prior report 2018, we were looking at for um, a household $75,000. Now what we're looking for, particularly in this family of four, uh, very expensive in terms of having two preschoolers that need childcare, we're looking at 79,000 plus to 87,000 uh, plus in terms of one's income. And um, more, I don't know if there's another slide after this one. There you go. So wanted to focus in on some of the trends that we've been seeing. Um, so we do a, a town by town comparison. We're taking a look at what was the situation two years ago when the third report 
was issued and we're also taking a look at what are the trends since the first report was done. And what we're seeing right now is that um, the highest percentage of households living below the Alice threshold continue to be in East Hartford, Hartford, New Britain, Wyndham. Uh, this piece about Mansfield and Vernon is interesting in that they've crept up. And so we're keeping our eye on that and that gives us insight in terms of areas and communities that we want to go further with, have conversations with municipal leaders, community leaders, school officials to find out more as to what are some of the circumstances that are happening there. We did see that 15 towns, so households in 15 towns, um, did see an increase in the number of people that were living below the Alice household survival budget. That's pretty significant. Conversely, 37 towns saw a decrease. And as important as it is to find out what's contributing to the increase in the number of Alice households, we also want to find out what's contributing to the decrease. Um, are those situational changes or are there some very specific things that are being done in those communities versus other communities? You don't have the answer to that yet, Paula? Not yet, but I can tell you that in 2018, when the report was issued, um, colleagues uh, and myself went out and visited with municipal leaders and school officials. And we focused um, primarily in um, Weathersfield and Bloomfield because there were si some significant spikes in those communities. And what was curious was that in speaking with the school superintendents and, and their senior leaders, they were not at all surprised because they could see the number of children that were qualifying for free or reduced lunch creep up significantly. And they asked us if we would present to their respective boards of education we also did it in West Hartford because there was a slight uptick there. And a piece of it is um, income being stagnant. And so um, not necessarily that you have families of lower income moving in, more so families that are there who, because they don't have a financial cushion and they faced a, a health issue, as an example, um, that they were slipping below. And so, uh, again, it, it, it merits going back. And in both of those communities, we uh, talked to them about an initiative that we formed called the Alice Challenge. And we uh, staffed it, staff and volunteers facilitated a series of conversations with residents that, were, that, that represented Alice households, um, community leaders, et cetera. And in Weathersfield, um, they established what they referred to as a navigator. They felt that it wasn't as much about services not being available, but people not knowing where to access services. So we'll be interested to see what that trend line shows as a result of connecting people to services. And Bloomfield is, is going through the process to determine what they feel is gonna best suit Alice households. Thanks. Okay, you're welcome. So things that we've done, right? And uh, you know, I'm looking at Paul because uh, Paul remembers when we, as a United Way, initiated our financial stability work. And we brought in an author, David Eggers, who uh, presented on his book called The High Cost of Being Poor, uh, Invisible in America. And we dug into what were some of the challenges that individuals and households were facing. And this preceded the Alice uh, report coming into being. We have been focused very heavily on workforce development, but not connecting people to necessarily any jobs, but connecting people to jobs that existed in the community and those jobs that had a career path opportunity. A key differentiating point in our, in our work with that is that it's all employer driven. And so we've had a group of manufacturers, the Advanced Manufacturing Employer Partnership. Uh, Pre-pandemic, their big concern was the skill gap and being concerned that they didn't have a qualified candidate pool. And we worked directly with Pratt & Whitney uh, uh, down to very small um, manufacturers. Uh, now that we're in the pandemic, um, it's less about that and it's more about job retention and it's more about what are the kinds of skills that individuals need in this environment. We also have an employer work group 
uh, that's focused in on jobs and healthcare. Again, pre-pandemic, uh, the job market looked different. Now we're looking at how to kind of shore up individuals that are in the CNA positions, the medical assistants, et cetera. Again, not, not high paying jobs, we understand that, but getting a foothold in the healthcare sector and growing. So we're going to continue to focus in on workforce development um, that meet employer needs. And that can also include those people that are currently employed and what they need to do to be skilled up for the current market. And then quality jobs, a uh, big emphasis, particularly with the small to mid-sized manufacturers that again, pre-pandemic, seeing a lot of job turnover, and it goes to something that Catherine commented on in terms of uh, hourly workers, predictability in terms of one's schedule, um, working with employers in terms of greater predictability about schedules and hours so that families can plan for transportation and childcare, right? So what are the things that can be done that have a greater assurance of people being able to go to work um, on time and consistently. We've been doing, again, uh, back uh, a good number of years, uh, focusing in on health resources. So we established a budget coaching program. Um, our Women United group has embraced family financial stability with an emphasis on single head of households and all that that entails. So financial education, financial coaching, match savings programs, all aimed towards achieving a financial foothold. Um, a new area of work has to do with health education, and this is an increasing part of what we're doing, and taking a look at the social determinants of health um, and recognizing how it's all intertwined. So we know that children in financially secure families tend to have better education outcomes. We know families that are financially secure, adults that are financially secure, tend to have better health outcomes. So we're dedicating significant time and resources to this area, bringing all of those facets together. Um, very soon, we're gonna have a public launch, but you're inside family, so I'm gonna share it with you. Um, Connecticut Children's Hospital CEO, Dr. Jim Schmerling, reached out quite some time ago said he wanted to talk about an early childhood um, education initiative called the Imagination Library to ensure that every single child that is born in the city of Hartford through to age five receives a book on a monthly basis. Um, this is a Dolly Parton Foundation initiative. Um, he was involved with this in Tennessee um, and they have enough information now to show the significant difference this has made in their in those children and their literacy levels. And joining us in this endeavor is St. Francis Hospital and Hartford Hospital. So you have our three major hospitals partnering with United Way on an initiative around early childhood brain development and early literacy skills. And again, all related that intersection of health and education. We've had a longstanding commitment to making quality early childhood education available and affordable. So we know that this is critical, not only in terms of the child's development, but also critical in terms of ensuring that their parents and caregivers are able to go to work, right? Knowing that their child is in a safe place. Um, I'm gonna be candid with you. We are very concerned, very concerned about both um, the soaring unemployment and we anticipate that it is going to be further compounded um, by what we see in the paper and what we experience in terms of businesses that are in a situation of furloughing, of job elimination, and we also are reading, and you are reading, about um, restaurants and uh, hotels that are being closed and do not, uh, are not going to open. So we're going to be taking a critical look with employers on jobs, workforce development. But the other piece is um, a critical look at childcare. Uh, Pre-pandemic, 40 plus percent early childhood education centers were on the brink of closing because they could not afford it financially, right? Childcare workers are essential. Um, they're among the lowest paid individuals with the highest requirements in terms of certification because they're caring for our children, okay? And at the same time, um, child care centers are very dependent on 
filling spaces, right? That's where they get their income from. You want to have full class enrollment. The pandemic has shown us that that's not possible. So um, we're concerned in terms of the stability of that industry and the importance, again, in terms of child development and people being able to go to work. So it's an area we're going to be delving into. Um, and the other piece, and this is more of um, what, what I just covered had to do with things that we have been working on for quite some time. We know that, that we are not the sole uh, reason why community households in our area have fared better over the last two years. We know that. But we also believe that because of what you have done as donors and as champions, along with the work of our nonprofit partners, we've contributed to making a positive difference. Uh, that's the, the longer term story. This last bullet here is what we did immediately in the face of the pandemic. And thanks to your support, and the support of the companies that you're affiliated with and other individuals, we were able to provide direct financial assistance to individuals who um, needed it um, because there was going to be a delay before any public support was able to kick in. So we did that as a group of Connecticut United Way statewide, and then our United Way activated its emergency response fund, and we were able to raise resources, provide it to nonprofit partners to, uh, again, provide individuals with those critical resources of food, um, also um, household support, uh, rent assistance, utility assistance, again, until more public support and private support could, could be mobilized. So just some examples of how you have helped, how your companies have helped, and the nonprofit sector and other philanthropic partners. Um, know that as we're moving through this again, we um, need to approach this uh, both with respect to an immediate response because people are in need. We also want to make sure that those individuals in companies where companies are faced with those really critical challenges of furloughs and layoffs, uh, making sure that those companies know the resources that are available through United Way and in particular the connection through 211. So we're going to be um, increasing that in terms of knowledge and accessibility. Also continuing to focus in on jobs, financial and health resources, childcare, and then what we need to do as we look forward, um, a growing need we believe in terms of basic needs. Uh, again, food, housing, uh, we just anticipate are going to be, and, and jobs are gonna be the, the three critical things as we move forward. So I'm going to stop and just um, ask, oh, sorry. Okay, so more is like, like running through things, so I do apologize, right? So effects of COVID, um, you all have seen and heard about the um, hour-long uh, stay in one's car at Rentschler Field with, with FoodShare. Um, one of the things that we've learned with respect to that is that um, people do not know. These are people, these are now folks that have become Alice households. They do not know where to go for food. They do not know about their local food bank. And if they do know, they may be embarrassed to go there. So we know that food insecurity, particularly for the first timers, this is going to be an ongoing challenge. Again, we've talked about job reductions and loss. Um, very concerned about the child care sector. Um, also saw, you know, some information in terms of um, just what folks, what educators are seeing now, the effects of distance learning despite parents' best efforts. Um, we have seen an increase uh, in reports of domestic violence as individuals have been at home under uh, very challenging circumstances and again, have seen uh, locally, and Catherine held this up, the racial disparities that have just been exacerbated. Okay. Any questions, comments, et cetera? Well, I guess I wonder how, given all of this, um, this year's fundraising drive has been affected, uh, if you've seen any changes one way or the other. Uh, thank you, Mary Ellen. Um, appreciate that. 
So I'm going to just share like on the upside. Um, you, we've uh, have some major uh, golf tournaments, as you know, particularly the, those among you that, that golf. And many of those tournaments have been canceled uh, because companies have very strict protocol about that. Um, but a bright spot, and this has to do with Raytheon Technologies, is um, moving forward, the sponsors of the golf tournament moving forward and still saying, even though we're not going to get together and play golf, we still want those resources to, to go to United Way. That's been great. We have a lot of companies that have jumped on board in terms of innovating employee meetings, um, moving to a more virtual environment. So we have some success stories around that. The flip side of that is that we've already received word from a, a, a few long-standing United Way partners that they are not going to be running campaigns this year um, because of their own financial challenges, because of the nature of their business. Um, we expect, honestly, that we will hear more of that. Um, and we also know that this is a time when um, you know, in the midst of furloughs and layoffs, what do we naturally do? We naturally think about our own financial security, right? It seeps into our consciousness. Um, that said, I do believe that this is also a time where people are going to step up with great empathy. And I think it's our job, right, collectively, to serve as those ambassadors and, and to be able to say, um, this is a time, right, when, when we're at the brink of what we know is going to be a long tail to the effects of, of COVID-19, uh, economically and from a health perspective. So we're going to be calling on folks to be internal champions and to encourage people to give and to give at whatever level they are comfortable and whatever level makes them feel good. But we do expect that it is going to be um, quite a challenge this year. Any additional questions? Okay. Thank you so much. We we'll turn it back to Don. Thanks, Paula. That was, that was an excellent job by you and Catherine. Really appreciate that. And every time I, I go through that, really just reinforces you know how, how important the mission of United Way is uh, globally and in our community here. So thank you very much. Um, Paul and Mary Ellen, I'm just curious, you know, if you have any, uh, as we think about this kind of town hall structure going forward, um, do you have any uh, suggestions as to topics you'd be interested in, you know, different ways of doing it? Just curious if you have any uh, feedback or input for us that we can continue to evolve this and uh, make it um, attractive to uh, many individuals, but also make sure it's something that is impactful. Yeah. Um, one thought I have is, you know, we're in the good old days when we could get together, we would often have the Tocqueville of events in the evening. Mm. Um, and I wonder if you might think about trying that. I think people are, in fact, when I saw the meeting notice at first saying eight o'clock, I immediately thought 8 p.m. Um, <laughs> and mornings are tough right yeah. now. Everybody's Zooming and everybody's got meetings and so on. So I, you might think about even maybe having uh, two events, you know, one in the morning and a parallel one in the evening to see if you might get some yeah, attention. Good idea. Very good idea. I, I have two, two thoughts. One would be uh, working maybe off the baseline of today's presentation, come up with sort of a set of social indicators for our region mm. that can be kind of standard and displayed over time as these meetings continue, because as has been noted, this is gonna be a multi-year recovery once the public health problem is addressed. Mm -hmm. And so I think if, if you, it would be very useful and potentially marketable. And I think Mary Ellen's exactly right in evening would be better than a first thing in the morning. Although for me, it's irrelevant, I, 24 hours a day, but a lot of people don't. Uh, I think if this forum could become a place to get 
real data showing what's happening in our region in all these key areas over time. I think that might be very attractive to people because you really can't get that any place else that I know of, you know, unless you go out and do your own research. So I think having a standard data set that gets reviewed with changes since the last time, since the beginning, each time in a very efficient way would be good. But then also go out and add in one or two or whatever number of people from the programs, from the agencies, from the community, partners, you know, supported groups to come in and do a little storytelling about what's going on and what they're seeing to put uh, some humanity into the numbers. And I think kind of balancing that out would get, and then always come back to what are we doing and where are we going in response to all that would be a good body of content to, to kind of be consistent about. That's great, Paul. Those are two great suggestions. Don, we do really have like Don, we do have one uh, additional uh, participant, Ebod. Oh yes, Ebod. Do you have any comments or anything? And if you um, uh, no, actually, I was thinking that this would be this is my first time calling in, and I thought that this would be hundreds of participants. So I'm surprised <laughs> to see so few participants, um, but. Uh, you know, I joined in late, uh, but really great work uh, by the, you know, uh, by the team. Um, and um, uh, I was looking for opportunities where I could help. Um, so I'll be you know, glad to help if any help is required um, in the future. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Um, we really appreciate that feedback. It's very helpful, Paul and Marielle and Ivan. And, and we also really appreciate you finding the time to do this with us this morning. And uh, mm -hmm. we want to continue to evolve this and, and to Ebod's um, point, really be able to attract, you know, hopefully all 80 or 90 of our um, Tocqueville members here in the region every quarter to have uh, an engaging discussion, but also really allow them to understand the impact that United Way is making in, you know, in our, in our area. So um, with that, I, ju I just want to, there, there will remind you of one thing. There will be a, um, a national Tocqueville uh, program on October 8th. You'll, you'll be getting an e-invite, so there might be something you'd be interested in. Um, it's around moving the race conversation forward, so certainly a very relevant topic. And, um, you know, Kim can uh, provide you any details mm -hmm. on that as well if you're, if you're interested. But uh, keep your eye out for that. And then also keep your eye out for our next town hall in the coming quarter. Um, I want to thank Kim and Catherine um, and Paula for coordinating and presenting and, and, and sharing this information with us today. And uh, I greatly appreciate everybody spending an hour with us. And it's right at 9 o'clock. So I know we're all busy. And have a great day. Thank you.